I'm Paul Cripps. I'm a production designer uh, for kind of uh, small to medium British films and kind of high-end drama and high-end comedy on television and streaming. My last show was uh, Ted Lasso, which is a, a US comedy for Apple Plus. I've been working in the industry for 27 years. My day-to-day -day kind of activity depends on obviously whether I'm working or not and depends what stage of the production we're in. Uh, if it's prep, I'm often in the art department or location wrecking. I spend a lot of time driving around finding locations with the directors. Um, it may be designing in my office or in the art department or overseeing construction. Generally, the job is very varied. Uh, there's a lot of traveling, a lot of moving around. A lot of different work, a lot of liaising and coordinating with other departments and people. Um, so it's pretty varied every day. I come from a small town in Oxfordshire, which is near Blenheim Palace, a big stately home. So there's been a lot of filming there over the years. And in 1977, when I'd seen Star Wars, and I'd probably seen Star Wars about 10 times that year because I was obsessed with it. And in 1978, Harrison Ford came to our town to film a World War II drama called Hanover Street. Um, and they spent two weeks in our town doing night shooting, uh, filming car chases. And Harrison Ford was the star along with Christopher Plummer. So I got to meet him as a kid and he signed my Star Wars poster. And, but it was also that just watching the filming got me really interested. And uh, my grandmother's florist shop was turned into a French boulangerie. Um, the whole town was turned into an occupied French town, so we had swastikas hanging from the town hall, um, which scared the tourists coming to look at Winston Churchill's grave. But um, yeah, it was just amazing how they changed the whole town completely, you know, and I, I spent the whole time picking up, you know, spent bullets from the guns, and so I became a bit obsessed. And um, after that, a couple of other films, History of the World Part One and stuff came to film at the palace. So we'd always try and bunk off school and go and watch them. So I didn't know how to get into it and I didn't know what to do to work in it, but I kind of hope that I might in, in the future. And I think it's because of that, that both myself and my sister, my sister works in costume in big films. We both ended up in the industry having come from a family who had nothing to do with the industry at all. When I left the UAL, I got a job actually in costume. I was helping a designer called Charles Node, who's quite a big designer, um, and he was doing a Ridley Scott commercial um, at Shepton, which was a big space thing. We were on H stage, the whole surface was like a moon surface with a crashed spaceship and these astronauts bobbing around um, on wires. And uh, uh, me and my friend Toby were part of the costume department helping the guys with the spacesuits. So that was my initial first kind of job. And then it was quite difficult to get work and I wanted to work in the arts department, but I ended up getting a couple of theatre jobs. So in the end, I went back and did my MA at the Royal College of Art in film and TV design, because I did theatre design, so it was a bit more theatrically based. Having done my MA, I did a placement on the original Judge Dredd movie. I did three weeks as an art department assistant. I desperately wanted to do it after that. Uh, and then my first job out actually ended up working, I worked in television in light, what we call then light entertainment, which is kind of chat shows and music shows and children's shows, because a designer came in to teach me and kind of liked my stuff and then tried me out for a day. So um, actually started working on that side of the business. And it was only a bit later that I transferred over and did more kind of film and drama. I was quite surprised really about the fact that how involved it was. When I first worked for that designer, I, he was having a show built in Manchester. So we did a model box for it, uh, for a music show in Norway, actually. I just thought I was going in for a couple of days to make the model box. Uh, and then I ended up going to Manchester for six months to oversee it being, well, three months to oversee it being built. Um, and I only went with like, two days worth of clothes. I had to buy clothes while I was up there. I didn't come back. Um, and then I ended up going to Norway. So it was, it was like a real 
in the deep end and I was straight into art directing so I never did any kind of running or anything so um, it was it was learning you know running whilst I was running alongside the job so I learned very quickly I think the first time I saw a show I designed on screen was probably a children's show so I did a number of children's shows when I first started um, I did the sooty show the, the, the kind of hand puppet and I did a show called The Tweenies, which was massive in terms of children's television and went worldwide. So seeing those first designs was quite amazing. You know, I, The Sooty Show was probably the first thing I'd ever designed a series that was on telly and my name was on it. So that was incredible. And then I co-designed The Tweenies with my, my now wife, Victoria. And we, um, I mean, that was so big. And we got the job kind of slightly by accident. Um, because we did a really good pitch. So it, it was a surprise. I think, I think I was really, really satisfied when I saw my first drama on, on uh, television, which was as if for Channel 4. Um, and that, that was kind of real, because it wasn't, you know, bright and children's, it was proper, you know, although it was quite teenage and bright, but it was, it was more like a proper drama show. So that, that was a real feeling of pride and enjoyment. I think I go through different stages of the best part of the job. I think I really enjoy, I'm, I'm really obsessed by script and I really, I can only do a job if I really like the script and I connect with the script. So reading the script is one of the times. And then the first initial meetings with the director <coughs> and kind of the first initial rec is where you're going together and you're discussing how you think the show should look or what kind of feeling it should have or what, what the ideas are that that's a really lovely time i think the other time is uh when you've seen a you've built a set or you've dressed a set and you've finished the decoration and then people start to come on the set and see it finally finished i remember doing i did 24 hour party people i was the supervising art director and we had to recreate the hacienda nightclub which was an iconic uh building in manchester and an iconic place that people have gone and we did it and then i sat on the stage when the first extras were coming in and the extras who were all clubbing were all people who were on the hacienda kind of list um so they were people who used to come to the place and we built it inside this warehouse so you entered this grubby old warehouse and then suddenly you're in the club and to sit there and watch people coming in and see their faces as they realized that they were in a pretty what they said to me was a, a really good reproduction of the club was amazing to see the shock on their face so that kind of thing is really good i think so people's reaction to your set when they walk onto it i think it's great I suppose the, the, the negative part of the jobs are maybe you're struggling a bit with the budget, you don't have enough money to do something you, could, you know could make it really good. I think also if you, I've had a number of occasions where you've built whole sets and you've, or you've dressed a whole set and because of the time that the crew has been shooting, they never get to that set and it never gets shot, that, that's a really disappointing time. I think it was a pretty bad time at the start of COVID because we, we were on day one of a really small feature film that I was really uh, in love with doing. And uh, the film went down on the first day and we dressed the whole set and it was all set in one location. So we'd done it all and then we stopped on the first day and then we had to take all that set down. So that, that was really disappointing. I would say there's often normally a reason for people, uh, you know, disagreeing with you or not liking what you're doing. Um, and I often find it's best to put myself in the shoes of the person I'm dealing with, you know, and think how they would be thinking about it. A lot of the time when you have difficulty with people like cinematographers or uh, costume designers or anybody who are having trouble uh, or you're disagreeing, it's often because they have their own issues about how they need to do something or how they need to light somebody. Um, and I think if you just put yourself in their sho shoes and see it from their point of view, you might see that, oh, okay, that's difficult for them. How can we do it so that I can achieve what I want to achieve, but also achieving it for them or making it easier for them to light or making it easier for them to shoot. I think with a director, you have to be on the same kind of wavelength. And if you're constantly um, disagreeing then 
you've got to look at that and saying, am I approaching this project in the right way? You know, um, and also it depends how the project is led. Some of the big TV things I do are producer led. So we have lots of directors. So it's, you have to be careful that you don't go down one particular director's road, you know, whilst not thinking about the whole, um, the whole of the series and how maybe the producers want it. I think in film, it's like different because it's normally a kind of director led process. So if you're not on the page with the director, I think you have to, you have to negotiate, you have to also pick your battles. So you're not arguing about everything, you know, and you have to work out what's most important to you in terms of, you know, the give and take. But collaboration is obviously one of the most interesting things about the, the industry, but it's also can be one of the most frustrating. So it's, if you, if you find it very hard to collaborate, you know, it's not going to be an easy process. short term I think it's going to be quite hard for people I think the filming is going to take longer uh, I think we already know that it's costing more which is okay you know on the high budget you know films and and high-end tv drama where it's financed by Apple or Netflix but I think on the smaller shows I think it's going to be quite hard budget wise I think it's going to be hard for a while with social distancing on set and catering and you know, makeup have got a particularly hard job, costume. It's not so bad for the art department, I don't think, because I think there's a way of working with two crews, which we kind of normally do anyway. You have a prep crew and then you have a shoot crew. So we can separate those people. But I just think um, in the long run, I don't know how much it's going to affect it. I would hope, and this is the hope of quite a lot of people in the industry, that things will get better in terms of the work-life balance. And perhaps we're not just all crazily working all hours of the day to achieve things that there might be a thought about you know shooting less and in a day and taking a bit more time and but who knows whether that will happen you know I think it's it's yet to be seen I think there's there's well it's been a long time since there has been a kind of support network I mean when the Big companies used to have their own design departments. It was a lot easier, but although it was hard to probably get into a design department. Once you were in there, if you were in the BBC design department, then then you could move up within a system and work on a lot of different shows. And there was probably more support. I think it would be good if we had some more kind of industry-based training. I think sometimes the universities are a little bit. Um, they have other priorities, you know, and I think the. The industry used to train itself with its own departments. I don't think that's going to happen again, but I think it would be good to kind of become a bit more specific to some to some areas, um, particularly the art department, because it is getting art department and VFX are getting so specific nowadays. I think people can make mistakes. I mean, generally the people. I mean, I went in as an art director, so when I made a mistake, it was quite a big mistake. And I made quite a few when I was young because I'd gone straight into art directing. Um, but a lot of those things we turned into, you know, successes. So we would, you know, things, things go wrong all the time in, in filming and television. Okay, things don't work. It's because everything is basically a prototype. So you can't expect things to be absolutely perfect. They never are. And that's why you have people on set to deal with stuff uh, and why you sometimes have to put things right. So I don't think there's any onus on people looking at trainees and thinking, well, they've made a mistake. I mean, also as a tra trainee, you would probably never be given anything big enough to make a mistake. And if, if you've made a mistake, someone will spot it quite early on. You know, so I think you can make mistakes and you do learn from that. As a person, it's probably how you deal with that mistake that, that will get you or not get you the next job, I would say. So it's how you move on from making a mistake, you know. Um, but I think everybody expects trainees to come into the industry not knowing what the industry is like, not knowing the speed, the amount of work, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think, I think everybody's attuned to that. Um, Obviously, there are positives and negatives to working in the industry, and it's a hard working industry. 
And I think that's got negative things because obviously people are tired, people work too many hours probably, relationships suffer, things like that. But on the other hand, there are positives about that in that you do push yourself and you produce some amazing stuff in a very short time when you know other industries take years to produce it. Um, there is also the idea that because it is a hard working industry, it does weed out people who are just getting into it because it's glamorous rather than wanting to do the kind of art department work. I've had trainees before who have come in thinking that they are like actors, you know, and they very quickly work, very quickly left because of the amount of work, the hours, what you have to do, some of the menial tasks you have to do as a trainee, but it, it highlights the people who are really keen to do the job. You need to be hardworking. You need to be patient. You need to be punctual. Uh, you have to have the ability to learn quickly uh, and also the ability to move on if you do make a mistake, try and put it right, move on, learn and adapt and don't make a mistake again. You really need the ability to get along with a wide variety of people very quickly. You know, we're all chucked together very closely and intimately for very short periods of time in intensive work. So you need to be able to get on with other people. And I think that's, that's one of the major things I would highlight. I think the ability to listen uh, and take in what you've been told, you know, make notes, you know, so that you don't, don't make mistakes purely because you've forgotten what people have said and just simple things like that. And also understand that nobody is expecting you to know anything. And that if you, if you don't know how to do something, just say so or ask, and it's not considered a negative. I would like a portfolio that shows people can draw and they have the ability to understand space, space and light uh, and how that affects the set. I think it's very good to see that somebody has taste, not necessarily, not necessarily your taste. I mean, it helps if they maybe share the same taste, but that they have taste, even if it's their own unique one, you know, that they have some interest in, in that area. Portfolios can look very, very similar. A lot of people have done the Pinewood drawing course. There's always that drawing. It looks the same for everybody. Um, so it's also finding some other stuff that's unique. You know, maybe something you've done outside of college. Uh, it's great to see little f films that people have made, even if it's their own stuff, even if they're not working on short films. You know, anything that makes you stand out in a kind of art department way would be would be good and just show your interests in terms of you being an interesting person you know i think and also like people to talk about their work you know i don't just want to flick through it i definitely think you should tailor the portfolio to the person i think there's a lot of things that you sometimes catch like if you come from near the place that they come from or if you have you've come from a country where they have shot a film or whatever you should definitely try and kind of pique their interest with something that goes along those lines um, and yeah I think although you want to show a wide range of work you do also want to tailor it to the person you're seeing so you know um, you don't want to put hundreds and hundreds of bits that they're not going to be interested in and also I wouldn't show too much I mean sometimes when you go for a chat if it takes you more than you know 15 minutes to go through your portfolio maybe it's you know too much to look at because I think I think that you'll probably have a half an hour meeting, maybe three quarters of an hour at the most. So you want to be able to flick through and get through all your work, all your different work, and also not run out of things to say and not start repeating yourself, you know. So I don't think you want too much of the same work as well. So a varied amount, even if some of it is not work and some of it is, you know, just stuff you like, you know, interesting stuff. You know, doing interviews for university and for foundation as well, it's really great to see how people come to things. Obviously, process in terms of drawing, you know, technical drawing or whatever, perhaps not. But in terms of, you know, if you've done a project, you want to see a bit of the research, you know, or even if you've just been researching something because you like it, it's quite nice to look at your research and stuff. And maybe you've done a little, few little drawings, even if it has no end final, you know, no final outcome or no end result. You know, it's quite nice to see that because that's something you're interested in. So I think it's telling you a little about your, yourself. Um, so, yeah, I think process is good.
Um, and also some of those, you know, first sketches you do are quite indicative of how you approach, you know, the whole project. So yeah, I think the process is good. I think interviews are really difficult. I think interviewers, I think most interviewers find it difficult as much as the interviewee. So I think if you can put the interview, the interviewer at ease by chatting and not, you know, waiting, always waiting for them to ask a question. I mean, obviously you don't want to come over as too over the top, but um, just, just trying to make a good conversation, you know. And also if you're an interviewee, do your homework, you know, find out what the person you're going to see has done. You don't want to look stupid or, you know, misinformed by thinking they're doing one thing and they're actually doing something else. You know, you should really want to go and work for that person and the stuff that they do if you're going to see them. So do your homework, you know, uh, and also do that when you're just ringing for jobs, you know, target what you actually want to do first, because there's, there's no point if you only want to work on science fiction targeting somebody who works in light comedy, you know, for 20 years, and then you never get to do it. If you really want to do it, I would say target what you want to do and try that first. It depends. I mean, personally, it would be like, don't always take the first job. When you're rolling, when you've got jobs and you're rolling, it's not always necessarily to take the first job just because you need a job. I mean, that's a very risky thing, but sometimes you have to hold your nerve and wait for a, the right job. Um, I think also I probably, I just enjoyed working. So I just worked and worked and worked. And I think you need to give yourself breaks. And I think you also need to try and target your career, uh, which I was never terribly good at. Um, and I was never very, very good at kind of self-promotion. And the other thing is always to photograph everything because I, I so rarely have pictures of my sets at the end of a job. I just don't have them. And to try and, you know, designate somebody to take photos when they're lit, you know, maybe one of your standbys to take photos for you because I never get photos of my sets until, you know, they're on screen. Uh, I just think, you know, when I first started to probably tell myself just to hang in there and, and keep plugging away and you'll make it, you know because um, it's hard at first and it's even hard now I mean that's one of the worst thing of the industry is I'm in my 50s now and I'm still having to go for interviews to get jobs I don't get given jobs straight away and you're always up against you know three or four other really highly talented people so it's a tough industry and nothing is guaranteed even now you have to just you have to keep focus and keep going and don't don't give up because it can be really hard you know um, I've had times when I've had like seven or eight months off without work and think, oh God, this is it, this is the end. But you know, you, you just have to keep plugging away and jobs come.